Oh, man. Woo, indeed. Hello, world. What is up? Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte. We are here live at the Build Studio in New York City. The book, Children of Blood and Bone, currently sits at number eight in this, its 90th week on the New York Times Young Adult Hardcover Bestsellers list. 90th week. All right. Yes, please applaud for that. That's insane. <laughs> now... To say the follow-up, Children of Virtue and Vengeance, is highly anticipated would be an understatement. Uh, while I don't expect, nor would I want her to spoil anything about the new book, uh, which drops tomorrow, by the way, I'm still really excited to talk to this incredibly talented, super creative individual, number one New York Times best-selling author. Folks, come on, make some noise and join me. Please welcome the great Tomi Adeyemi right now. Come on, do it up. Let's go. Amazing. Thank you. I am so excited you're here. Congratulations on everything on the second book, which is tomorrow. Tomorrow. We're a new book eve. This is it. It's crazy. It's no, I woke up this morning. I was like, one day more. Like, it's, <laughs> it never feels real, especially because these things are years off when you start them. Right, right. And so, and now I'm like, oh, my God, you wrote two books. Like, not even a book. You wrote books. You, you got books Literal. now. You, you got, got a stack. books. Like you, you got a stack yeah, books. it feels good. It feels it's, really it good. Must. I, I can't even imagine it. It's so amazing. I had seen somewhere that you'd said, you know, when the first book dropped, yeah. that it, it didn't feel real, you know. And since then, you what? You've been on Fallon. You were the cover was in the the jumbotron for for the GMA book club. It, you've been called the next <laughs> J.K. Rowling. All these crazy things are happening, uh, and it's still you're saying still doesn't feel real. Not yet. It hasn't hit you. It hasn't sunk in. I think the thing is is like, I <laughs> write, people don't believe that I'm an introvert, but I was like, to write books, it's kind of because you don't want to talk to real people. Oh, I'm so you sorry like you're here right it. now. It's like, I like people, but it's like, you really like the people in your head. Right. And I've been doing it since I was a little kid. So like these, because sometimes people are like, oh, would you write if people weren't reading? And it's like, I, I have 20 years of that. I would do that. You, you do it in your head. You create it in your head. And it's a very intimate thing. Mm -hmm. And so... It's still surreal to me, even with the first book, even to see a physical book, because it's me in a computer screen or it's me in a notebook. So even the book, I'm like, oh, I made that because I didn't go to the printing press and I didn't I don't know what a printing press you works like. But ideas. in my head, you worked on this thing forever <laughs> yeah. and now it's a real physical exactly. object. And it's something people hold and yeah. then they step into the world. But the world is in my imagination. So you step into my head. And that, so it, it's surreal, like every single time. And now there's there's two like different points of entry, so yeah. Here's here's the big question. Let me ask you this: with everything that you've you've experienced so far, with the movie and all this sort of stuff that's going on, the billboards, the whole nine. At what point did your parents exhale a sigh of relief and go, "Well, it's not a doctor, but this is good." See, I always say it's never with a first gen. I was like, I could win a Pulitzer and be like, "That's great," but you're not a doctor. I saw a tweet. It was um from it was a best selling author. She was on a plane, and then the their like, announcer is like, is there a doctor on board? And her mom's like, that should have been you. And she's like, mom, please not now. She's like, why don't you go over there, build them a website, see if that helps. And, I, you know, and I'm like, that is a first generation parent. So, so yeah, there's still, there's still the joke of like, well, maybe after the third one, you could apply to medical school. It just to, it's just a Nigerian thing. It's a first generation thing where like, you could be a really successful author but you're still a failed doctor you so. were on the tonight show with jimmy yeah. fallon yeah and they're like well jimmy fallon's not gonna be there forever <laughs> yeah, you need to figure out what you're gonna do exactly exactly so they're very proud but that's just it's just a part of the culture and you yeah. learn to well, like, you learn to laugh keeps a fire under you too right yeah it really does it really does because that's what i we have sort of this kind of boom of Nigerians in more creative fields. And we kind of bring that work ethic, that like that same intensity of, okay, I was gonna do this in medical school, but instead I'm gonna do this towards my passion. And so it's very methodical, it's very intense, it's very perfectionist. So I do think the real, even though we joke about the being the like failed doctors or engineers or lawyers, those are all careers that in, like require an intensity yeah. and a path and a precision. So I think that's what we see, whether it's in books, or comedy or, you know, I think that's what we're, people are experiencing. Yeah, 100%. And that was something that I think 
I recognized in your in your work is that the precision, the attention to detail, the care within which you've built this elaborate world, and I think that's something that you can you can feel, you can sense as you're reading the book. That uh, I love this thing because I know the person who created it loves it as much, if not more, than I do. Right? Yeah. You feel that in the work. Uh, how quickly? Because I forget if it was a podcast or what I was listening to, but prior to this series, before this trilogy, you were working on your first book, as you called it, and it was like three or four years, and it wasn't yeah. going in the direction yeah. you wanted. How quick? did this story come out of you this this world this I call that first book because it was the first book I tried to get published right. and so that was like a four-year effort from opening the blank word document to like 63 rejections wow. and that knowledge whereas this from opening the blank word document to turning it in to be on shelves three months later was a year and a half and book two it's almost a blackout I like I'm still I, I'm always like what year is it what time is it what day is it Am I, did I turn in the book that's why it also doesn't feel real because it's just so stressful for so long um, but I tell people the first book I tried to get published even though it didn't go anywhere we wouldn't be here I wouldn't be looking at this if if it wasn't for that, because it taught me every, it taught me how to write, it taught me about publishing, it taught me how to try and publish as big as possible. And so I kind of got the toolkit, and because my brain knew how to do these things faster, more efficiently, because I knew my voice, because I was could make better intentional choices about, okay, you have five book ideas, let's start with this one, and then we'll go to this one and this one. Like, I was able to kind of pull it all out faster, but... Uh, even I'm, I think that's why I'm also surprised because I'm like, I don't know how book one was written. I don't know how book two was written. Do you, yeah. Does it, obviously the, there's the stress, the time constraint, it makes it more difficult. But how, how do you maintain the level of confidence that book two, especially with the amount of pressure after the success of book one, it's like, okay, here's this amazing thing that you put a lot of time into and you've crafted and you've placed every piece immaculately where it needs to be. Everyone loves that thing. Give me another one that's better than that and half the time go. Yeah. How, how do you, how do you <laughs> navigate that? It's, the, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle the entire time. I always right. compare it. I was like, imagine baking a cake right. um, and people are like, okay, why don't you throw in the eggs and I'm ready to frost and you're the beer like I don't even have flour and this is going to give us all salmonella and I'm like you know that is that was kind of the the three-year process the one thing that's always saved me is being such I'm a really intense perfectionist I'm really hard on myself so I've all I always do and will put more pressure on myself than the world will put on me like it took 88 weeks of book one being on the bestsellers list for me to write in my journal like you know what, I decided I'm satisfied. You know, I still think I could do better, but I did the best I could given the situation I was in. Um, and there's been lots of success. There's been lots of praise. Like, those things come in, but it's still, I'll always be harder on myself than anyone will be on me. So when it comes to book two, I think it's kind of the data point of like, are you ever going to be perfectly happy? No. But do you know enough that you not being perfectly happy is still a really exciting, great story for everyone else? I think it's also the, this stuff in my imagination is so big and so vast and so particular. And I'm like, and this will be the part where that, that part of freedom will play. And you'll hear Beyonce saying, I am the dragon breathing fire. And then Zaylee, well, you know, like I see, I see the whole, I, I see all of it. And so because there's no way to get as much as in here on the page, I try my best, but I'll always be like, oh, I still think it's cooler in my head. So I've sort of made peace with the fact that my dissatisfaction yeah. is enough, is still very good for other people, but it still is like there's that fire. It's like, okay, I want to I wanna be. I think it's because of being Nigerian and growing up, and it's like I would get an A- minus on a test. I'd be like, Dad, look, I got an A-, minus. and he's like, you can do better. And I'm like, you know, it's okay. Dad, look, I got an A. You could do better. Okay, Dad, look, I got an A+. Plus. Like, mic drop. What are you going to say now? That's what you're supposed to do. Like, you know? And so when I was a teenager, yeah, I was so frustrated with him. But that's sort of, it. that's still in me. Yeah. Where people are like, this is great. I can do better. It's an incredibly <laughs> valuable thing to have yeah. instilled in you that early on. Especially in any creative business, much less this one. Yeah. Where, you know, you think of that first book that uh, two, three or four years. And it, it, it didn't even become the thing that you wanted it to become. But you know that you put in that time. You, you stayed diligent because it was leading you towards this other thing. You just kept yeah. working. I you could do to better. People. I'm going to do better. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I talk to people so much about 
that because I can say it now with hindsight. Obviously, there's the success to back it up yeah. now. So, but, but when I was, was in coming. it, yeah, yeah. for to spend four years on something of your yeah. free time, and this was like I'm talking like the the six months, the last six months of that four years, that was like six to midnight every night as soon as I got off work. Like you know, I wasn't. I wasn't like, oh, I'm just trying to learn. Like, I, I went for it. So it was very emotional not to succeed. It was very emotional to get rejected. Exactly. And I think the thing that, that you said, is, it's really easy with the success now and the hindsight yes. to talk about it. But yeah. to really to hammer that home, four years of a passion project with no promise of any payoff. There are people, I know tons of creative people that have a passion project that lasts them a couple of months. And it's like, eh, I wasn't going anywhere. I stopped. I, I started doing yeah. something else. You stuck with it and you kept doing it. And, and this that's, was, that's a so I thing. was always the other person. Where I'm like, what if this person had lightning in a uh, couple months? Uh, you know, that wasn't one. What if it was, I, I would always go to something new. And this was the first one I was like, I don't get to go to something new. You're going to see this through. You're going to try your best. You're going to try and make your dream. And I still wasn't even admitting to myself I wanted to be a writer. Yeah. It was, mo it, I got more intense about it when I left college and started working at a job that I was unhappy with. And I was like, well, let me, I was in LA. Uh, what was the, can I ask what the job Yeah, you can ask. Yeah, yeah. Even sometimes I'm like, oh, I hope like you my like where you bosses who, don't who was your Who was your supervisor? But I, I want told names. my bosses at the time I was unhappy, so it's not like it was a lie. Uh, or that I was, I'm always like, oh, I hope you're not. Well, like, you're like, what you're still job? very good like, people. What, what was um, the day to day? What were you it doing? It was, I was marketing at, a, it was like data-driven marketing at a production studio. Oh, man, I'm falling um, So it's, you know, I'm a nerd. So I'm like, I'm into, like, Nigerians love to market too. So I was like, oh, this will be really cool. But it transitioned from using all this data to be like, how would we pitch this show? Which audiences do we think will grab? Like, things I like to think of about. creative in there. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, it's, there's at least, it was very stimulating. But it went to like, okay, now instead of doing this, we're just going to upload ads to Twitter. And I was like, so I was, I was miserable. Yeah, yeah. So I started sort of, I was like, well, what if what you do at night could be done in the daytime? Yeah. And that period was extra emotional because that's when I wanted someone to read it and give me permission. I was kind of looking for someone to give me permission to go for my dream and be like, hey, you're actually good enough. And, you know, Ava DuVernay always talks about, like, you know, because she was a publicist. So she was publicizing directors and actors in this. And she kind of talks about that period in her life of kind of waiting for someone to lean in and whisper, hey, do you want to be on this side? Right. And, and she was like, and at a certain point, I realized no one gives you permission for your dream. You give yourself permission. Right. And, you know, no one, my, not my parents, not my boss, not my my friends was going to say, hey, it's OK for you to leave your well-paying, stable job with potential career advancement opportunities that will still be stimulating and enjoyable to you for this dream that you've been too scared to admit you actually have for 20 years. No one's going to say that. But it was like once I realized, oh, I so I just say that to myself. Yeah. I can quit my job? It, you, it was like a... Do you remember what it was that got you to that point, that got you the realization, why it was you realized, I got to do this or I'm never going to? I don't know what tipped me over. There wasn't over. a catalyst. I, there wasn't a specific mm -hmm. catalyst. It was more just that... Because we're, we're so programmed, I think... Like society has lanes and rules and general goalposts, and we're kind. Life is so crazy that you kind of stick to. We're as humans, we stick to the familiar. It's just psychological. So even me having a revela or revelation—that's a word. Yep. Even having a revelation. <laughs> yeah, I'm like you should Best know. You're a writer. writer. You know. <laughs> but like, I even being like, I can quit my job. Yeah. Like, of course, I could. I could have quit my job the first day, but again, we don't think those things because I'm like, no. but I have health insurance and a 401k. Is that a thing? You know, you're yeah. sort of looking around, and I think that's part of like growing up. You, you, especially leaving school. If you're kind of, if you're in an education, I guess, focused setting, and you go from like, go to high school, go to college, maybe go to that, you know, it's very easy to to figure out how to move forward in those. But when you're sort of cast out into the world for the first time and you're like, well, you're the goalpost, but I don't want to be my manager. Right. And okay, I maybe could switch to this department in three years, but that's not, you know, you're like, this is what I want. And oh, I just have to go. You, you know, you kind of be like, oh, there, no one gives you permission as an adult, you give yourself. So it was just sort of like those that clicked. And once it clicked, 
it was this big revelation because when I was waiting for someone to give me permission, every almost, like, let me see some more of that book would be, I was on cloud nine. Every rejection, I was in, like, the abyss of hell. And, like, oh, I was like, this thing in my day. It was literally, and I, w- I would go through that in six hours. Like, I was not I, oh. probably a fun person to be around because it'd be like, oh, she's so hyper. Oh, I don't know what happened. <laughs> she opened an email and now she's, like, she's really in it. But then I got to look back at all those as, oh, that's not a, a up and down. Look how close you got. Look how close you got knowing nothing. You know, I started doing my research and I'm like, if you could get this close knowing nothing and having all these other pulls on your time and attention, if you really make this your goal, you really like, I call it Slither Claw, like 150% Slither and 50% Ravenclaw. I was like, you open that Excel sheet, you make a plan, you look at the data, you do this. You. It became less scary because I went from if to when. And if you go from if to when, then every obstacle you face, every rejection you face is like a lesson to help pivot you in the right direction. But if you're if, every rejection is like, well, is it ever going to You unravel every single time. So that's what I tell people a lot. Like, especially when I talk to students or creatives with dreams, I'm like, is if you give yourself permission and you decide it will happen, you will then be able to get there. But if you're if you don't, you're always gonna changing that perspective. It kind of helps you yeah. uh, get the armor that you're gonna need to endure exactly. all those things and that come along. Exactly, and it's fuel. Because again, sixty three rejections, you learn a lot. The biggest thing, the common thread, was people are like, "You have something, but I couldn't sell this book." And I'm like, "Hmm, is there a list of books that sell well? Let me figure out why the thing I wrote isn't marketable today." You know, exa- you, I have a literal, clear place to go. Um, and I found out it was because my first book was a love letter to Harry Potter. And so it was like, oh, it's something, but that's not what people want to read today. People want to read epic fantasies. Well, I love epic fantasies. Let me write an epic fantasy. So let's talk um, about that. So, so yeah. then you make that decision, right? We end up, here we are. This is the world. Yeah. And for a lot of people, this is their uh, first time being exposed to a lot of this mythology. And I'm curious, in the research, how much about yourself did you learn in preparing yeah. for this book? I always describe this stuff. Th- writing these books are weird because they're kind of like fantasy memoir fan fiction. Um, yeah, and it's it's weird because especially going back on CVB, I'm like, you know, I start I was an English uh, literature major, mm-hmm. um, so I start seeing like I start psychoanalyzing myself. I find out things I didn't even know, and I'm like, oh, this is who this character represents, and this is who they, oh, and this is what this means, and this is what this conflict is actually about. This thing, and with book two, you know, I have a plot, and then I start living out the plot in my own life. Um, it's, so it's, it's a very strange thing, but in terms of the actual mythology, I discovered it in a gift shop in Brazil. And it was, I'm, I'm a big believer in kind of like fate and destiny and stuff, because I was in Brazil to go to, they have a museum uh, about like their history of slavery in Salvador, Brazil. And so I got a grant my senior year of college to go there. And so I thought, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Brazil. I'm going to go to this museum. I'm going to try and fail. I knew I was going to fail at it, but I'm still going to try right. to write this epic kind of Toni Morrison-esque novel of two sisters separated by the slave trade. One's ends up here one's up and here. intergen I could never write that but I was like if you'll pay me money to go to Brazil and find that out I will I'll take yeah. that <laughs> so I have this whole thing I get to Salvador Brazil the museum is closed for renovations Uh-oh. I'm freaking out I'm like what am I I'm not I can't give you I don't have like this money to give back I'm literally here for this and it was raining one day I end up in a gift shop because I don't want to get my hair wet and the gift shop owner is kicking out people who are clearly doing that. So I'm like, use those big eyes, look interested, like, oh, 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 you know? So I'm just like milking it because I it, it, it didn't look like it was going to let up. And that's when I saw the Orisha for the first time. And it was just these like postcards. Um, but I remember being like, this is African, the last air, but you know, I saw this yeah, dark right. skinned black God breathing fire. I saw this beautiful black goddess commanding the ocean. Like it was, it was everything I had ever wanted. And instantly the world of Arisha came down. I was like, oh, okay, they ride giant lions and there are these temples. And like, I saw the entire world. Yeah. Um, but I was in about year three of the first book I was trying to get published. And my whole rule was you don't get to switch when a sexier idea comes along. Right. Um, and I also didn't no Zaley yet. I knew the world, but I didn't have my my protagonist. I didn't have a story. So I was like, table it, see when that comes into into view. But as I started learning about the Arisha, I was like, oh, this is a part of my heritage. This is not only West African, this is 
Nigeria. This is Yoruba. Like this is literally as specific to my culture as it can be. Possibly. It's. I told yeah. people it was like finding gold buried in your backyard right. your entire life. Because when I asked, I remember asking my parents, "Have you ever heard about the Orisa?" And my mom was like, "Orisha," <laughs> and I was like, "So you know enough to shade me, but you're gonna leave these magical stories like out of your magic loving daughter's." Life. And so, and they explained to me like. Oh, my mom grew up like um, with Islam and she's like, well, we didn't teach you about Islam. And that was a really like the most helpful thing I could have heard because it gave me it helped me enter this with like this is a part of me. But this is a thing that's been a it's religion, it's mythology. It's spread through the world because of the slave trade. It's different in every region. It's Santeria and Cuba. It's Candomblé in Brazil. So it was just this really rich history to pull from and be inspired from, but also to do it in the most respectful way humanly possible. Because even if this is a part of my culture, I didn't grow up with it. And this is this is a real religion for like over 100 million people in the world. So I wanted to 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 do it justice, to like shine a light on it, but in a way that honors it. And yeah. The thing I take away from that story that blows my mind is that this entire elaborate and beautifully constructed universe, it all exists because of your exposure to one or two images. And I wonder like, in your wildest dreams, now that this best-selling series is out there in this movie, what do you hope people will then create because of your series, because of what you created? Like, what, what in your dream would you see it kind of come back full circle and see more of out there? I mean, it's already happening in a way because it's exactly what you said. One image, one random image of gift is this whole world, which could be like one of the biggest franchises in history one day. One image of a dark-skinned, like, black girl with green hair started me, started the... Though, okay, well, what if she was a fisherman? Like, what if she had to go to a market to trade? What if the two pictures, and we're like a thousand pages later, we're 90 weeks on the bestsellers list, we're this adaptation. And I'm like, if that's what two pic the first two pictures I saw in my life, that's the thing. I was like 22, 23. So the first two, if two pictures can do all of this, what do you think a, the the people growing up, or children growing up in the age of Black Panther, in the age of Children of the Blown, in the age of it's Farewell so to, and Crazy? It's quantify. That, I try to right? quantify like, it so much. That's a great example of it's how so the littlest seed planted can spawn the most uh, On the beautiful, amazing thing. On the opposite things. side yeah. of the spectrum, like the very first story I ever wrote, I was around five, six. I put myself in that story twice. I just saw the parent trap. I really wanted a twin. I really wanted a horse. We've all been there. We've all been yeah, there. Yeah. We've all been there. And my parents wouldn't give me a twin or a horse. So I was like, I will give myself a, you know? And like, I guess as a kid, I was like, give yourself permission. And I, the story, it's Tomi and Tomi. So I literally put myself in it twice. Every story I can find from that age till I was 18 and I realized I was doing it, all white characters are biracial characters. Mm. And that, no one read my stories. So there was never someone who sat down and said, hey, you can't write black people in stories. I had internalized from the world because there were no black people in my favorite stories. So I was like, oh, you can't be in your own stories. You can't be in your own imagination. And 10 years writing alone in my, so that's what, I try and make it as specific as possible because I'm like, that girl would never write these. You gave that girl two pictures and now we're here? Like that's how, powerful representation is you we're humans are complex but we're simple if we don't see it we we don't understand i remember when like the cursed child came out and people were like there can't be a black hermione you can't have a black witch and at first i was so upset i was like oh so you can have ogres and trolls and wizards but you can't but then i thought about it and i was like well if you don't see it you're like that can't you know how many stories do have wizards? How many stories have trolls? How many stories have black witches? Right. So it's you know I went from anger to like actually it's just psychology. We're not even talking about prejudice or racism. If you don't see black witches, you don't think they exist. They exist. If you see trolls, you understand a troll. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I was like, oh, this real like images are not only important for the like people who don't have that representation. Right. It's equally if not almost more important for the people who don't, because that's your only access. That's how you begin to humanize and empathize with people who are different from you. You started writing this, what, 2016, give or take? I believe. In that ball, ballpark, a while ago, a couple years ago. Yeah, three, 2016 years. was, was like the first years. book. Yeah. It's 
been no time since then. Yeah. But <laughs> do you feel like even just the slightest bit, the needle is starting to move? Are, are we pro- are we moving in the right direction? Are we progressing? Are we getting where? Are we heading towards where we need to be? Are we seeing more? Even just since your book has come out, have you started to see like it, all the fan art, all the amazing cosplay, all this stuff, the fruits of the labor? Like already, it's coming back. Like yeah, I say I always say we are moving in the right direction, but we can't get complacent. That's what we tend to do that as a society. We like we get one big success, we get one big move, and we're like, oh, it's over. Right. Black um, Panther, there we go. We're Black Panther, we're done. We're, racism Let's is over. We but like it, guys. the biggest it, example yeah. to me was like when Obama was elected. There were so many people like racism is, is over. And I'm like, well, that's not even when it was even during those terms, even though we had that great symbol of hope and progress, right. that's when Trayvon Martin happened. That's when the national conversation about police brutality happened. And then when it was to switch administrations, we saw a very big shift. So I always use that as a reference, like, yes, we're moving in the right direction, but we're still need to counteract centuries of being in the wrong direction. So there, we can't go, CBB, we're, we're done. Yeah. It's over. Exactly. Representation. I was like, no, we need to be this aggressive for literally decades, if not centuries, to actually be like, we're chill now. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> so problem solved. Yeah, problem solved. Um, you know, to that end of, of inspiring the, the future creative minds and the future storytellers, ready for this segue? Yeah. In addition to this book, <laughs> you've got a journal that's coming out, a CBB yeah. journal that's also being released tomorrow. Yeah. And I bring that up because it is, it, it makes the world more real. It's a more tangible thing for fans yeah. of the book that want to make their own and create their own that are inspired. It's a really cool tool to kind of immerse yourself in. How did the journal come about? Are you a big journaler? Do you journal as well? I do journal. Yeah. That's part of, I've kind of had to figure out self-care things throughout this process because it's been so crazy so now I'm big on exercise um big on journaling I'm I need to be better about meditation and stuff but what journaling is, is big how do you push yourself to journal when you're r- trying to meet deadlines I've written all yeah. day do I have to write more like how, how do you keep yourself it's, honestly schedule? most of this has been I turned in book two like mid-September okay Cool. And so, uh, and this isn't normal. All of these books are supposed to be turned in like nine months in advance. So like it was down to the wire the whole time. So a lot of it has been post that process and being like, okay, you were under a lot of stress for a long time. Yeah. You dealt with a lot for a long time. You got to kind of unpack that. Um, you got to kind of heal from that so you can not only get back to yourself, but get back to where you want to be so you can continue doing this work, not only for book three, but even these conversations. Because I meet a lot of writers. I meet a lot of people. I meet a lot of dreamers. Mm. And, like, I'm I'm not the cat poster. Believe in yourself. I'm like the, okay, here's what you got to do. So you got, you know, I was like, here's your Excel sheet. Here's your master plan. Like, you know, because I like to make things as concrete as possible because I'm still risk averse, even though I take big risk all the time. So I'm like, I can mitigate that by being as analytical as possible. So I'd like to try and introduce that to other people. Well, you said something er earlier that was very simple, but I I found very inspiring, which was this book from opening the blank word document to here, because that is such a universal thing that everyone knows and is experienced for whatever. We've all opened the blank word document, even if we're not writers and we've had to do homework. We've opened the blank word document. And I loved when you phrased it that way. I don't know that I've heard it that way, because it brings us all to to that same starting line that you were at, which means if we work and do it, this is the finish line that's possible if you are if you love what you're doing and you're committed to it the tools are there open the blank word document and do it yes and I, I really think, loved that one little bit yeah. just describing the beginning of this that way I think there's some writers carry a lot of shame yeah. like I told you I didn't show anyone my writing yeah. before the news about my book deal came out about like seven people in my life outside of my family members knew I wrote so everyone was like, what the? And I was like, well, I've been doing this alone in my room for decades. You know, it's a, it was a big surprise because writers carry a lot of shame about what we do because you open the Blink Word document yeah. and you have this idea you're excited about and you put it down on paper and it sucks. <laughs> and then you hold up your favorite book and you're like, I'm definitely not cut out for this. So it was a big revelation for me to know like, oh, my favorite books start as blank documents. Oh, there are several drafts oh, it sucks for a long time and you just make it better each time and eventually there's a tipping point. I tell people now, give yourself at least five drafts to suck, if not 10. Because I'm like, I can't wait to release first drafts of CBB and CVV to let people know like, oh no, this is like, this is jank. Like this is like this is rough yeah, it, it for a, a minute, like <laughs> minute. My first book, like the 
end draft was about draft 40, mm. the one that got published. Wow. This one was around draft 15. Mm. And I'm like, and it sucks for a long time. It makes no sense for a long time. Like, that's a part of it. But we don't know because, and that's how I think a lot of things are. We see the finished process. Yes. You don't see the, what did I actually wake up like, you know? And so you see the finished cover. You don't see all the covers that were like nicks beforehand. So mm. I'm big on trying to peel back that process and be like, no, if you're sucking, you're doing it right. Because that's going to suck for a very long time before it's good. How, how much of this do you have mapped out? You know where it ends. Do you have a title for book three yet? Yeah. You want to tell us or not? I do not. Okay, okay. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, no. I, <laughs> wouldn't be doing my job. You wouldn't, know. All right, yeah. fair enough, fair yeah. enough. Uh, how much has, because we got to go to the audience question stuff in a second, but um, I'm just curious, how much has the, the what we see deviated from that outline that you've come up with? How much has that evolved as you found other bits of the story? Yeah. Book one kind of exploded out of me, right. and even though the through revising, it was like about getting to the cleanest, most powerful version of it. The story for the most part was like, sim again, there's so many changes, but like for the most part was the same. Book three, like kind of what was gonna happen exploded out of me. Book two was the big mystery for mm. a while. So book three, I've always known what was gonna happen. Um, I, Is book uh, three done? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh. I know it was the most evil laugh. Um, oh, no, I was just kidding. Yeah. Did you finish three before? No. no. Okay. No. Uh, um, it's, it's, I know where it's going. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know the, yeah. It's, okay. I'm really excited to, Fair. to really make an epic conclusion. Yeah. Um, so you know, you, you it's kind of like, it's honestly kind of like a road map. Some, you might take different back roads, or at least for me, because everyone's process is different. Yeah. You, book two, like all 15 drafts, I will say the first 10 of those drafts are all completely different. Like completely different characters, completely different plots, completely different magic systems. Right, right, right. Um, and it's only for draft maybe 11, that's when I'm like, okay, so the 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 char this character works here this plot works here these 200 pages need to go this magic system is confusing what if the, let's plot that the, the, nix that and so it's only around then that i begin to put it all together and then make that better so i don't think book 3 will be as exploratory because i feel pretty much like i know what's going to happen and how it goes down um but that's why again that's why i say there are so many drafts give yourself at least five to ten drafts to suck because you got to explore yeah. in order to be like this is the best version of that idea this is the best version of that idea let me put it all together and now i look amazing it's a so. part of the process i've seen a lot of people struggle with is the allowing it to be bad part. yeah um last thing before we go because i see i got a question from a twitter uh, viewer out there so don't worry kevin it's coming uh, but i gotta ask about this uh i recently read i think it was as soon as maybe august or later that the movie uh, is that Disney now? It's under Kathleen Kennedy at Lucasfilms, and it may very well be the first film uh, uh, intellectual property from Lucasfilms that isn't Star Wars and isn't Indiana Jones. So it'll go Star Wars, Indiana Jones. Zaley! <laughs> yeah, insane. it's insane. It's insane. <laughs> it's insane. Uh, congratulations, it's insane. first of all. Thank you. Second of all, how does that feel? What yeah, is that it's like? It's so surreal, and most of this stuff, the one, the both blessing and the curse of being like so stressed for three years is I got to just kind of bury my head in work because yeah. I know how to work hard. So I kind of like peeped out now like a groundhog and I'm like, wait, what, what? And I got to go to the campus and they were showing me like a reel of them putting the Star Wars like, I was about to ask, are there perks? You've seen Star Wars yeah, stuff? There was yeah. The, yeah, they showed a reel of them creating this universe, and it was like 11 a.m., and I like put on eyeliner because I'm like, I'm just going to an office. It's going to be fine. I'm bawling in the theater. I've just met these people. But it was just so overwhelming to be like, wait, this is a this is a, a glimpse. So it's so cool to, to, yeah, to just be with Disney's Fox and Lucas Films, and I'm just excited for... Yeah. I mean, it was already crazy, but now I'm like... It just keeps getting crazy. Yeah, this is insane. So it's it's insane. It's very surreal, but it's cool to work with such passionate people who are excited to try and build a completely new world and a world that looks like this. That's yeah. that's that's crazy. Like black when I was writing Children of Blood and Bone, Black Panther didn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. And my whole thing was, oh, I would love something like Black Panther to exist, so let me try and create it. And we, we, we saw what a global phenomenon that right. was. So it's, it's really exciting to be like, okay, we can, we can do that with something, with something 
brand new and something yeah. with someone who looks like this like that that's so exciting yeah. to me yeah well uh equally exciting book two drops tomorrow yeah we are hours away. yeah uh super excited for you i'm so thank you so much for hanging out and chat oh, thank let's, you. Let's, this has been cool i'm so glad you're here let's do some audience questions before we wrap things up all right kevin i promised you i'd ask here we go uh kevin horzella says dear tommy you featured some artists in the special edition of cbb how was that experience and what does it feel like to have people creating art that is inspired by your creation hi kevin kevin is an amazing german illustrator and i recognize the name because he did this beautiful illustration of amari that's in one of the special editions of so the is book. kevin kind of on the slide plugging his own yeah work? he's oh, no he's that, i think he's i think he's serious is, is kevin i, I see think you. he's serious but if it is i like it um it's it's the best thing, like I said, this came from two pictures. So whenever someone draws one another picture, like that, that's very meaningful for both me and my like, just my self esteem. Because I think a lot of artists right now, especially artists from marginalized backgrounds, are creating things to heal their like inner child. So I talk about the little Tommy inside of me that still spent. I still spent a decade not writing myself in my books. So I've spent still less time writing myself in my books than I haven't. So it's it's surreal. It's surreal to see just all the art and all the creativity and the passion. Yeah. Um, because it feels like, again, it feels like that little Tommy is being embraced and nourished and like nurtured. Yeah. And, and yet people are just so talented. And then they inspire me. It's because I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Oh, I love the way she drew those animations. Let me describe it. You know, there it's such a cool process. And so then when it gets to be an official collaboration, like with the journal you mentioned, a reader came. I met a reader at a book festival in L.A. like two years ago. She had she called them doodles, but it was the most elegant design. She had painted it on the cover in like gold and it was so beautiful. And I was like, I want this. And she's like, trade me book two and I was like it doesn't exist yet but I will win. so I knew I kept this girl in my mind and then Barnes and Noble's like we want to make a journal and I was like I know exactly who needs to design it and it's like and I had already followed her and so I love as many opportunities to really bring people's just brilliance and passion together and that's the kind of the great one of the nice parts of the internet is uh, like I said Kevin's in Germany but I see I see his picture in my feed and I'm like this is great I'm featuring it in fan art Friday oh an opportunity where I get to put fan art in a book I know one thing I would like to put. so I love that I love that great question Kevin uh okay I got a couple in the room right let's do it up you've got some microphones come on down how you doing sir all right I'm good um, congratulations, Tommy, Thank on, you. on all your success. Thank you. How much involvement will you have with the film? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I laugh because a lot of, a lot, when I get that question a lot, I see that sort of look in the eye, and I know that look because I'm that person too. Because I'm such a fangirl, I'm such a nerd, I've also been burned by adaptations and especially representation. Um, and so the, re I always say you don't like, I wouldn't have said yes to people that I didn't trust to do this right. Um, and now we're three years, because I used to get that question like a year into it. Now we're three years into the process. So I've been working with these people for three years. I've seen the passion, the enthusiasm, the like, oh, we want to be on set tomorrow, but we still want to get it right. So that's, it's like the perfect blend of enthusiasm and patience. Cause it's like, we know the opportunity we have and we know, we know, we basically, we know. That's why I always say, I was like, don't worry. I was like, I am a fan girl at heart. Um, I, I hate bad adaptations. So it's, I'm working with really amazing people and they're really including me in the process. And it's one of those things where it's exciting. Cause I'm like, oh, you're, they're making me think about my series in new ways, and it's it's like a, it's a creative infinity loop, <laughs> essentially. And we're like, oh, this, and what if the magic was like this, and what if it was like this, and then what if this? It's like it's really fun. So I'm I like, you'll know, you'll be able to see in my eyes if there's a point to be <laughs> afraid. But it's it's like I can I can really look at you and be like, we're we're dedicated to doing this right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have you found your uh, Azalea yet? Do you know? No, we don't have Azalea yet. Okay. Yeah. So people watching that are dreaming, that people, door's still no, open. But that's the real thing. Yeah. I think people ask me a lot. They're like, oh, who do you want to be? And I think, and I point to like, you know, Black Panther sort of put Letitia Wright and Winston Duke on the scene. Um, and it was also this amazing blend, though, of established actors like Lupita, like Michael, like Chadwick, like Angela, like Forrest Whitaker. So I feel like there's 
amazing opportunity to do that here where we can see some people you might not have met yet, but you're going to love. And then also some people that, you know, we've grown to love. I think that it's going to be a really cool blend of both. Very cool. We're going to do one more. Go for it. Hi. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I, um, oh, it, 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 like, it took me a while to wrap my question, like, to, for it to come out my mouth. Yeah. And then he wound up touching on it. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm gonna ask another question. Okay, let's go for it. First of all, your brand is incredible. Thank you. I like, I, I, I like your brand. I yeah, a, I like that. We need to say there. that more. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I want to know, right? Because he he he, he kind of touched on it. Yeah. I want to know, like, how did your brand actually come apart? Like, how did it all come together? I know that you touched on it with the with the drafts and the yeah. Draft 15. Like, how did you like? How long did it take for you to realize that your brand was actually coming together? And do you create two, or is this more a curiosity thing? Um, if you create, that, I'm <laughs> no, I, like I have a reality show. Yeah, I, okay, yeah, what is it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you come from okay. Yeah, yeah. So. I think the biggest thing for me was again the failing with the first book I tried to get published. Um, because again, four years to get rejected 63 times. Like I put that out a lot because people are like, it happened overnight. No, it did not. Um, but the reason I put failing in quotes is because I my brain, you you gotta train your brain for these things. So sometimes people are like, oh, do you like do you screen write? And I was like, yes, but I'm not gonna give myself that gold star yet until I fully indulge myself and my brain in screenwriting. Because can I think about story? Yeah, I think about my stories as if I was putting together a movie, but to write a screenplay is its own specific art. To write a good, to create a good reality show is its own specific art. Though good can be like super trashy or really like thought provoking, but even then it's an art. And so all of these things, I'm like, oh, if you wanna be good at it, you immerse your, like train your brain to think that way. And that's what the four years was, training myself on, oh, how do you compile a story? How do you edit quickly? What is your writing voice? What is getting a literary agent like? What is the publishing industry? What is a book deal? What is this kind of book deal? Ooh, what's that kind of book deal? Who got that? How did they, that's a, that was like, I call that first book my MFA. I didn't know it at the time. So I wasn't sitting there at my, failing is fun. No, I was like, this sucks. But it was after I had given myself permission and then I could contextualize and be like, oh, look at your toolbox. I talk to people about that a lot. I'm like, you don't know when you're going to get your CBB idea. But if you have the toolbox, you're in control of building your toolbox. So if you build your toolbox so that when you get the idea, you're ready to execute, you're good. If I had CBB as the first idea that I tried to publish, I I did not have the toolbox. We wouldn't be sitting here. But because I had a toolbox built over four years of how to write, edit, publish, like I could then, I could build very quickly. So that's what I tell people. I was like, no, you should be trained. I think T.I. said it too on like Rhythm and Flow, where he's like, opportunity. Uh, let me not do his voice. But he was like, I was like, let me, who knows if he, I don't want to say. Yeah, I was like, oh, we're on the internet. Um, but he said something like success is opportunity, when opportunity meets preparation. That's what it is, because you aren't in control of having that idea, but you are in control of your ability to execute that idea, whatever field you're in, be it creative, be it business. Um, so that's why I'm like, you, you, you know what you want, build that toolkit, and then when you have that thing, then you can make magic. But if I, it's a lot of CBB success too is timing. Mm. So if I had had the idea when I did, but still didn't have the toolkit, we're still not sitting. I don't think we're sitting here three years in the future. You know, like you, you don't know when those opportunities are gonna come. You don't know when that audition is gonna come. You don't know when that job position is gonna open up. So you, it's up to you to be ready. Mm. Like uh, what is it? It's like stay ready so you don't have to get ready. You know, there's all these things, but when you really think about it, like, okay, I can't control that. But if I'm, like, I have a friend who's an actress, and she got her toolkit. She went to an MFA program. She trained for a year. And so then when she got an opportunity to audition for a perfect thing, she nailed it. Had she not gotten an MFA for a year, that's potentially a different, like, you know, conversation. So that's what I just say. I was like, build your toolkit because you're in control of that, and then you'll be able to make the best of it. Yeah. That was great. Well, okay. <laughs> well said. Thank you. Round of applause. Why not, right? That was... Really valuable stuff. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you for that. I got to wrap things up, okay. but it has been so awesome it's having you really here. It's been really fun. Thank Congratulations you. Congratulations again on the second book, on all the success. You got to come back for book three. I would love you to come back. You got to come back when that movie I drops. I will. I the will. The littlest bit of news. I, wanna come, I want you we'll guys be to come back. We'll be right here. I hope we're it. here with the whole cast. You are amazing. Thank, thank you for you. everything. Thanks for being here. You guys were a fantastic audience. Uh, thank you for being here and hanging out. Yes, you are correct. Your instincts are right. Make some noise and applaud. Go get a copy of Children of Virtue and Vengeance tomorrow. Keep going for Tommy Adiemi, ladies and gentlemen. Please keep it going. Thank Let's go. Thank you. <laughs>